Well, good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Beam, and I'm CIB's program director. And today, um, the end of November is is our third uh, Meet the Editors series with um, Professor Mohan uh, Kumaraswamy, who is the editor of the Journal of Built Environment Project and Asset Management BPAM, one of three CIB's recognized journals. Mohan is coming to us today from Sri Lanka. He is um, he is an honorary professor at uh, the University of Hong Kong and also at the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka. He has led many research projects over over the years and has almost 400 peer-reviewed international journals and conference papers. He is uh, a very active in professional institutions, held high offices in Hong Kong and Sri Lanka. I'm really happy to have him here today. Uh, he's done a lot of work with uh, the United Nations, World Bank. He has degrees from Loughborough University in the UK. Uh, great, great uh, colleague, great supporter of uh, CIB. Uh, Mohan is also um, the co-coordinator of CIB Working Commission W122 Public-Private Partnership. So we really want, want to welcome Mohan and thank him for taking uh, the time here today to have uh, a Meet the Editor series. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from his, from his expertise. Um, and so I think uh, Mohan, you're going to talk for a little bit. I think uh, at about slide 15, we're going to get the audience involved, and then, um, and then you're going to finish up, and we'll have uh, a nice uh, Q and A. I think that's how we'll run this operation. And so, uh, Mohan, we are seeing uh, your Zoom screen right now. And uh, yeah. We just saw the slides there for a second. Um, yeah, I I had I was on mute, so I need to share again. Yeah, yeah, I think it's. Yeah, Can you there see the we go. Yeah, it looks great. It looks great. You sound great. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Mike. Um, always good to do something with CIB, uh, great organization, <laughs> great organizers, and welcome to all the participants, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope that this session will meet your expectations, if not exceed them. So this is the third, as Mike said, of the Meet the Editor series, and uh, I thought of entitling it uh, about BPAM which is the journal, uh, which is one of the three CIB recognized journals, but also about authoring and reviewing journal papers, because I guess that some of you may be interested in that. Some of you will be experts in that and can tell us something about it. You can share during Q&A uh, what I have missed and what I said wrong. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some insights and examples, which is what I can do in half an hour. And just to put it in context, the reason I chose this topic, when I got to talk about the journal, but the first two, uh, the previous two presentations, because there are three CIB recognized journals, and the previous two were titled uh, Writing Articles with Impact. And that was by Paul Chen, who's the editor of CMNE, Construction Management Economics, and the one on BRI. Stephen Emmett spoke on engaging and publishing with BRI, the editor's perspective. So I'm trying to look from the point of view of the editor, of course, but also from the authors and the reviewers. So that's what I'm trying to do. And let's see whether I do it well uh, or good enough. So BPAM, to tell you what it is, because we start with that. Um, the background we launched in 2011 and uh, okay, to, uh, Blow, the, blow our trumpet a bit as a game changer in the journal landscape is how we heralded it. Linking project management to asset management, or as some would call it, facilities management in the built environment. And uh, the story is that there were many journals in project management then, 
many in facilities or asset management, but we did not see anything that was significantly focused on linking the two areas. So we felt a gap and uh, Emerald jumped at it, uh, the publisher. So we ended up with um, publishing with Emerald uh, pretty soon. So 2010, we sort of got it approved and 2011, we had our first issue. It's indexed in Scopus uh, pretty soon. Um, yeah, as I say, and then ranked in ESCI. So it's not in the Science Citation Index. Uh, it's a bit difficult to get in there for some journals uh, for various reasons, but we are in the Emerging Sources Citation Index actually for a few years, quite a few years, uh, and recognized in Australia by the Australian Business Dean's Council amongst others, of course. I'm just giving you some names. And just uh, got crossing continents in USA, Purdue University did a survey about 2013 and classified us as a break, one, of, one, of, one of the 12 breakthrough journals. And then, of course, a few years ago, maybe two, three, uh, three uh, we, we were very proud and pleased and privileged to become a CIB recognized journals. So, the, uh, so we got into the three that they recognized. There are many encouraged journals, of course, and we are indexed in many others. So again, to expand on two things in the previous slide, the scope, BPAM, okay, is about cutting edge research and development in construction project management and infrastructure asset management. Because the intersections between these two areas, domains have become quite critical and the convergence is happening where, for example, people, have been thinking about whole life focus, the whole life cycle, not just costs, but value, and about sustainability, which crosses the whole life cycle, cradle to cradle, as they say. So obviously, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious that we need to link project management upstream with infra asset management or facilities management downstream. So, Okay, this second para also talks about that and just says that we go to buildings and civil engineering infrastructure, uh, but also welcome papers that focus on either side because we did try the first couple of uh, issues. If you see that they, they do link most of them in the first couple of issues, do link the two in one paper, but we, it was difficult. So we welcome papers on either. And then um, these are the other databases that we are indexed in. So I won't spend time on those. Uh, the site score, now many people ask us about site score. I'm not a strong believer, but I know it's uh, necessary uh, because some universities insist on looking at it and more than that portals and so on. So this is the picture of our site score in the last five years. And also the tracker, which is at the bottom right, the 2021 tracker, which is where we are now, because they keep updating it monthly, is better. Now, what is even better, but which does not show in this, is that we actually have been underrated. And that if you look at the notes at the bottom, uh, the people who compile the scores and who do the computation and publication, have accepted this uh, six months ago uh, when we realized what was happening. There were two errors that have depressed our above scores. So I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling you the facts because people asked us, how come we were in this quartile and then what, what happened in 2019? Why did our site score drop? Well, basically it dropped due to double counting uh, of the number of papers. So the site score for those who know it, is computed by a numerator, which is the number of citations. And the denominator is the number of journal papers that they are taking the citations on. Now the, num the numerator remained the same, but the number of journal papers got double counted because when they were published online, they were counted. And then when they were published uh, in print also, they were counted, which was unfortunate. And um, it was, found out when we started complaining and uh, that is being corrected, but it takes time. And 
because it's based as, as the bottom line on a three-year moving average. So it will be corrected over the next three years, unfortunately. And we had a second problem, a double whammy. The second problem was we found that we had been categorized in unreal, unrealistic categories. So the moment we pointed that out and asked how that happened, we didn't know. Uh, they readily agreed when we presented the reasons why we should not. Well, one category was okay, civil and structural engineering. We will remain in that. We were, but we were not in building and construction, uh, which was very strange. And we were in something like management science. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I mean, that was more than management science. It went into more detail, which we never really focused on. So anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on that. This will get corrected, but it'll take time. Um, and they, they, of course, refused to change the old slides course. So the editorial board, um, well, sorry for putting myself there. I mean, <laughs> maybe I should put myself at the bottom of the slide because uh, we have very prominent uh, joint editors. Uh, Lawrence is uh, also on this call. Uh, Professor Thomas, and my colleague from Hong Kong, who has moved now to CTU. Uh, Professor Yasangika is also on this call um, from Moratu, Sri Lanka. And well, she's my colleague too, and I work closely with her uh, because, as uh, Mike introduced me, I have links with Moratu as well. And deputy editors, you can recognize the names. I won't go through one by one. So in uh, UK, uh, Hong Kong, actually, Patrick is right now in Singapore. Alfred in South Africa, uh, actually, Tanzania to start with. I mean, all these are my friends. I've known them for a long time. Janaka, uh, who's in Canada, origin from Sri Lanka, then Dalsi, in Purdue, and so on. So I won't, okay, Reg these are the regional editors on the top right. So you can just glance through them and you recognize some names, Australia, Africa, and the assistant editor in Moratua. Next slide shows the associate editors. And uh, well, again, you'll recognize some names uh, right down the line. And um, how one becomes an associate editor? Well, some of these uh, I got to know. He was, uh, Bankole was a guest editor of a special issue. And uh, Michael was a guest editor, but I've known him for a long time in Hong Kong. He's now in Newcastle. He's Chinese, although his name is uh, NZG, G, I think he's Indian. He's Chinese actually, Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, Jackie has been with me a long time from the time he started. And uh, uh, Boeing also was a guest editor and he's associated with the journal a long time. So there are some people with a history, guest editor um, uh, and so on. So I will not go in. And some people I just spotted the talent when they were doing reviews. And some people actually approached me because after writing like Nada, he, after submitting papers, he, he got very interested in the journal and really you should ask him why. <laughs> and he, uh, he uh, did some reviews and I realized he's good for associate editors straight away. Uh, so that's how it goes. I think has been with us, most of them have been with us for a long time. Editorial advisory board, again, you'll see people uh, from top to bottom that you can recognize. Well, some of you can recognize some of them. Uh, Chime, Steve Rawlinson. If I just go top to bottom, Alfredo in Chile, uh, Patrick Zhao in Australia, and uh, so on. So it's those are the that's editorial advisory board. We don't uh, trouble them too much. The previous slide, they do get involved. Um, so, of course, we have an editorial review board, but I, I don't put all the names. That will take another two slides. So we are quite, you know, we got a very strong, diverse team. I, I wonder whether you noticed that. And in terms of uh, um, growth, we grew pretty fast, and I would say organically, uh, because we started with two issues. Florence will remember this with 14 papers per year, seven per issue for three years. And I was trying to get it increased at that time. Now Emerald is asking me to increase the number of papers, the number of issues. Uh, so we issue, increased to four, four issues in 2014, five uh, from volume six, that's 16. And we had 42 papers. Oh, uh, we planned for 42, but we had to increase it to 54. And Emerald was actually happy. Normally they don't like to go budget, but that time they needed the papers. This was COVID time. Uh, and so next year we are going for six issues and aiming for 48 papers. It's not yet finalized, uh, 
but it should be 48. And this is what we, well, you can see the, if you look at our table of contents, wide spectrum authors, high caliber reviewers, uh, editorial team you've seen, then we also have special issues and also diverse topics, but within the scope of BPAM. PPP definitely is within the scope because it goes into long-term, not just short-term projects, right? Uh, also the operation and maintenance. So these things you can see BIM uh, by people like Peter Love. Okay, I shouldn't mention names because I'm not mentioning others. Uh, so these were guest editors uh, from various countries. And then if you go to the next slide, another the, the other special issues as we go on, and you see a lot of sustainability, well, a few sustainability uh, focused issues. These are actually linked, these particular issues that are here and a couple of others later, linked to our World Construction Symposium that is uh, conducted in, in Sri Lanka every year. And this grew out of those linked to the uh, best papers and the shortlisted papers from that, that are related to BPAM. So that's called the World Construction Symposium. And the focus is on sustainability. So we also have others, productivity theory, and became a popular uh, special issue, as I'll show you later. Uh, uh, a colleague from Hong Kong, again. Um, and if we see, go further, this, okay, these guys were from University College London. Uh, EPP again. Uh, from Australia, data analytics, big data. So you see the topics we cover the, you know, the, the hot topics, construction for and circular that was uh, Bangkole, Abusi, uh, and Singapore, uh, PPP again. So guest editors from Hong Kong. Again, um, you know, closing the circle, smart, sustainable, and resilient built environment. Uh, this had also linked to a WCS World Construction Symposium, and that was a bumper issue published a short while ago. Um, then this one is forthcoming, and I think I saw the one of the guest editors uh, registered, and I think I saw another, the, the, another guest editor uh, just uh, entering the conference, the, the webinar now. Um, so this is from Australia uh, and India. KPI is, uh, yeah, Sangika is uh, leading this. Uh, so we have moved, if you look up smart cities, smart villages, rural infrastructure. So we're going a little beyond the usual things, smart villages. Well, there's a smart villages lab in the University of Melbourne. So it's not unusual. And the guy who's leading the special issue is running that lab. Uh, so hopefully we go to smart countries, smart planets, talking about COP26 and so on. But of course we need smart people and we are looking for them, <laughs> right? The search is on. So what's uh, upcoming right now, there is a call out. Uh, in fact, Hemant issued the call today. I'm putting the names because these are calls which are current. Um, so this one, the deadline is December 15th. So anyone interested should get to it fast. This one, the deadline is February. The call, the call went out today actually on CNBR. Um, so you can see the topics. Now, talking of special issues, performance. These are the, uh, these are the sort of, but uh, Emerald gave me some statistics when I asked for them last week. So they picked out that these are the five top performing special issues in the last 12 months. So it's not really fair because it's just the last 12 months. Uh, so it's a snapshot. I mean, I know BIM for built asset management was very popular for many years. Uh, one of the first ones uh, from Australia, led by Peter Love, whose name I mentioned anyway. Um, so, uh, so you see the number of papers and the number of downloads, are, um, and you can compare these uh, different topics. All right. So you can see that we have a wide audience uh, doing these downloads, interested in a range of topics. And if you look at the whole, that, that was about the special issues. If you look at just the downloads of the whole uh, spectrum of uh, issues, regular and special, um, our downloads numbers are like that. I mean, I don't know whether that means anything. Uh, and uh, second highest uh, up to November. These are only up to November for comparison. And we are second highest because the highest seems to have been 2019, right? 
uh, about authoring, right? I said about BPM, about authoring and about reviewing. So now we're on slide 15, Mike, and uh, I'm going to first put these points to uh, the, the participants. What makes a good paper? Uh, and this is from Emerald, Guide to Getting Published. So these are not my words. You can just skim through those. Uh, originality, what's new? So we always ask for new knowledge. What is the relevance to an extension of existing knowledge? Of course, a research methodology. Are the conclusions valid, objective? I mean, one might add to that. Is the methodology rigorous? So I hope your minds are ticking if you're not asleep. I can't see you at the moment, so <laughs> I wouldn't know whether you're asleep, but uh, uh, research methodology is always um, looked at carefully in some journals, including BPAM because we want to see the validity and uh, whether it has been, uh, whether it can be replicated and whether it can be extended with the adjustments if necessary and so on. So clarity, structure, quality of writing, of course, logical pro uh, progression of the arguments. Um, you know, there should be a story, but it should be told logically, not rambling on. Theoretical contribution to theory and practice, in other words. Recent, the, relevant, the references should be recent, up to date, and relevant. So we don't want you to reinvent the wheel. So you start somewhere, stand on someone's shoulders, but uh, you must show us that you are really moving forward from what people have done before. Uh, not just us, not the editorial board, but the audience, the, the readers, uh, if they are to keep interest. So international global focus. Having said that there are papers with case studies from countries which are fine. Uh, but we try to put them in a broader context and see whether there's any applicability or not uh, in that region or that type of country and so on. So Edicott, of course, it has to be within scope. Good title keywords and well-written abstract. Uh, follows and the referencing house style. I mean, abstract is very important, although I just said it fast. And we look at that during screening, which I will come to later and help the authors actually improve it if they haven't uh, focused enough on that. And the referencing style of course, these are the cosmetics. Now, uh, Mike, uh, I don't know, we are not doing very well for time. I think we'll have to leave the questions for later. Uh, am I right? Sure, that's, that sounds fine. Yeah, we can because, leave the, yeah this, is, this is a good list here for us to think about as well, and we can come back to it at the end, yeah. Yeah, my, my uh, initial take, and I asked Mike was to open up the chat now uh, so that we can, uh, so I know what the, where the audience is coming from and what type of ideas they might add to this slide. But unfortunately, uh, I'm not doing too well on time. So um, I better keep going because I need to get to the about reviewing. So we'll take the Q&A later. Uh, and anyone interested to question or add to this, please do so later. So, okay, having finished uh, a study, um, it's supposedly original and breakthrough findings. Now you bring it to the boss and the boss says, now go develop a paper for this, this journal or that journal. Now that's easy enough to say, but then you start the next journey. And the question is, uh, are we going to survive with so many people like this on the road? Now, who are these people? They are the reviewers, the associate editors uh, who help and maybe the editor-in-chief. So some are going to be a little tougher than others, as you know. I mean, all are human reviewers, and they're not, you know, they're not very different from us. They've just done more than us, more experience, gone deeper, and that's why they're selected. But some authors too, and they, they go down this road uh, just like us, I mean, I do. And uh, I meet this type of people. And maybe the guys on the right look a little more formidable uh, they, they are wielding more formidable uh, deadly weapons. <laughs> the guys on the left, maybe the reviewers who try to help you. Okay, not with a club, an axe, well, it's not so fatal. Maybe you might go to hospital, but you come back and do some corrections, minor <laughs> corrections, major corrections that they get through. And you don't worry, you got the associate editor and the editor in chief, perhaps writing short turn on the left extreme at the back, who will sort of uh, look out for the Grim Reaper on the right. <laughs> and make sure you don't get uh, you know, unfairly treated. So there are some checks and balances if uh, 
some reviews are too strong uh, and has a chance to um, you know give one's opinion and so on so it generally it, it does i would say work out okay so in bpam so let's see how we go what is the process uh, just an overview uh, paper is submitted to the editorial office well actually the editorial office is me <laughs> because so i see the paper first and then in, in BPAP, in other journals, it is different. They do have someone uh, full time. And then, but I don't do all the screening. I get help from a very strong team uh, of five people. And uh, what I do is I do a pre screening and look at it very quickly and see whether it's totally a way out. And I better put the authors and everyone else down the road out of their misery. And I if it's necessary to reject it, I do there. But if there's a slightest chance that it may make a grade to a journal paper uh, after review, at least I send it for screening. And then we have a team. Uh, originally, it was only the assistant editor, but now we have two associates, uh, another person who is in the review board who have developed the expertise, of course, uh, working with me, uh, and they know what we are looking for. So they know the criteria and they do the draft. I uh, sort of uh, add to it, uh, adjust it, and uh, rarely change, uh, change, change the recommendation, but usually the recommendation I must say is to send it back after screening for the authors to improve format and content, because usually authors get something wrong on the, being over length or not giving a structured abstract or something like that. There are some details in the next slide. And then if it is corrected, it goes for review uh, to an associate editor or joint editor who sends it out to reviewers. And you see that process in more detail, comes back to them, gives a recommendation to me. And I, at each cycle, maybe for revision, very rarely, I don't know any paper, maybe one that was accepted the first cycle. Usually one review, well, I would say usually two reviews, uh, occasionally one review and not, I mean, quite quite a few go to R3. Uh, although some journals uh, that I know that I'm actually on the editorial board, they don't go to R3, but we do. And in very cases that we think there is still potential, we have gone to R4. So fourth revision. So does it go into a black box when it goes to review? I showed you over you, let's speak inside. Why do some review cycles take longer? Why do some processes finish? How to improve the accept acceptability of one's paper? These are the things in detail. Now, since I'm not doing well on time, uh, I will invite you to go through these rather than me read them word by word. So EIC is editor in chief, rejects if clearly unsuitable. So that's my pre-screening. If we are assigned for screening, initial screening, these are the checks, plagiarism as well. Um, we have some naughty authors, <laughs> not many, not many, very, very few. And uh, there are some repeat offenders <laughs> that I've noted, uh, well, at least one. And uh, then we make a decision whether it's rejected at the screening stage or proceed to review. Proceed to review, that's the first hurdle. And not uh, then, um, in fact, I should say the rest reject rate is higher than the reject rate after review, which shows that we really weed out the stuff. But wherever possible, we actually help them. Sometimes you make two one submissions in, the, in rare cases, usually one one submission and they get it right. Because we're not going to do a review, but we point out obvious errors or improvements, improvements, even if not errors, improvements that will enable them to be better received by the reviewers. So you see the type of criteria, right? That we are looking at in screening and then it goes on. So then what happens after screening? Handling editor who could be associate editor usually, but now we got some deputy editors, joint editors in the team. Uh, and they, in, this is a usual process. I, I will not go through that, how the reviewers are selected, but it's not easy job to get two to three, especially these days, to agree it's tedious takes time. Sometimes we need to invite more. So it's a bit of a painful process. So this is how we go. And after they agree to review, normally given four weeks, and some may 
not give it till the 13th hour they have to be reminded i i get involved because i do a scan and see which which, pa which papers are very late and if it gets more than a week or two late it gets redlined but even before that i try to because I, to be honest i know quite a few of the reviewers even though i didn't invite them the associated in my so I, I asked the associate editor or i myself send an email please do this so system order reminders are only once a week and for two weeks so the rest we have to do by manually so sometimes we need a replacement reviewer if uh, reviewer is being very late delinquent i mean there are the genuine cases where they've had sicknesses and so on so some as you know there's a range but generally it's okay it's within a within a reasonable range some are good some are excellent and constructive and as i said i spot those type of reviewers they do to a feel like that i try to get them on board bpm uh others may be hastily compiled not so helpful when, when reading the review with experience you know whether they have just put it together and uh, some reviewers may contradict the others so now sometimes there's a conflict of interest and we get some like naughty authors we get some naughty reviewers too sometimes they say oh you haven't cited these papers and they uh, list a few papers including three or four of their own now that's not a good practice so I, I know some journals do that they say you haven't lifted enough papers from this journal we never do that i wouldn't even think of that uh, that's not the way to increase citation scores so and in fact, some people have caught on to that game, some uh, rating agencies, and they exclude the self citations for a, for a certain score. Anyway, uh, these are just uh, little, little uh, things you learn on the way. Uh, then, as, these are again the standard process, right? So, you know, the usual decisions and revised papers go through the same cycles. So, this is after revision for revised papers, the reviewers' comments, handling editor, back to me, and uh, decision. Process continues until we do or die, until it's rejected or accepted, hopefully accepted. Actually, our acceptance rate is not so bad as you will see uh, in a following slide. Um, then over to the publisher who conveys acceptance, hoping that things have gone well and uh, copyright, all those things uh, done with the publisher and some uh, proof uh corrections minor grammar and typos so not expected to be much so then this is what i told you but this is a breakdown of the okay now please uh get this uh, clearly i got this just uh you know uh, last week uh statistics from emerald but i had some questions and then we sort of massaged it a bit because this is what happened this year between first january to 25th November when they gave it to me. But these are the, this is the profile of the actual decisions. Now, if you look at the caveats, the warnings, these numbers are not verified. They look, the percentage breakdown seems reasonable. Actually, the numbers were wrong. That's why I questioned it. And then I realized they have been double counted. Some papers that were minor revisions have also been gone to major revisions and either been rejected or accepted. So there's a double counting, uh, definitely. But these are the decisions that were taken in that year. So it gives some picture. And as I told you of the rejects, although you see 25%, uh, two thirds of these were during the screening. So once we got it going, we do try to be constructive and help them along because we've seen some potential. And so if you see, this is not too bad, right? Compared to other journals, but that does not mean the quality is low. You just go into the uh, papers and have a look. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Uh, and the reviewer time, which is a very common question. Now, this is a bit exaggerated. Actually, they first gave me the number of days as 21. And I, I said, that can't be correct. It's, it's going to be more than that. They said, oh, yes, it doesn't look right. And then they say 50 days. Now, I think that too is uh, not quite correct, but it's not far off. It may be 45 days, like one and a half months. And that's an average. It's overall because special issues, some are good, but some because the guest editors are going up the learning curve, appointing reviewers, getting the reviews, it may take longer. Um, some. And also for the first review, it does take longer. But the second, third, go faster. It does, does not take 50 days. Uh, because by that time we got the reviewers on board, we don't have to look for reviewers and we invite the same. Some do, uh, you know, 
back out for some reasons, health or something, but it's more difficult to appoint a review at that stage, but we do. Right, now we're almost at the end of my presentation. And uh, what are the rewards, recognition for authors and reviewers? Because this is about authors and reviewers apart from BPAM. Well, BPAM gives, like all the Emerald uh, publications, they call literati awards every year. Um, and for outstanding reviewers, so you can see some names, uh, which was awarded last year. We do have names for this year too, but I thought this uh, will give a good picture because, okay, I'll tell you why. Because this year they have actually re reduced the number of awards and I did argue to give more, but unfortunately they have reduced uh, the highly commended to one this year. So I'm showing the last one. We've been having three highly commended for a long time uh, as a standard for Emerald Journals, but this year they've reduced it. Um, so we have an outstanding paper from US actually. Uh, you see various names, but uh, Korean, Chinese, probably South American, uh, but uh, they are based in Texas and uh, well, like all of us in different places. Uh, highly commended papers, uh, this one, and you see the topics, you see the range of topics, water, integrated project deliveries so procurement and so on. And at least one of these is from Middle East. Uh, can't remember which one, uh, the first or the third. Okay, so you see, you see the, the reviewers also. So that's uh, the last slide uh, in my presentation. So I'm thanking you for your patience and asking whether you have any questions, suggestions, uh, observations. Um, and uh, I would uh, welcome some discussion. I see hands are being raised. I, I need to, oh, I, I do see my uh, chat box, uh, Mike. I thought I had to get out of screen share, but I, I do see it now on top. So when, when they yeah. are. So I'll keep it on for now. And Mike, I'll let you uh, moderate from now on. <laughs> yeah, so, great. great, great. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Mohan. Very, very interesting and uh, very insightful for, for us and uh, the global audience. Thank you so much. I think uh, Duga has a question. And you can unmute at the bottom. Yeah, can, can you hear me, Michael? Yes, sir, I sure can. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Mohan. Um, uh, it's nice meeting you. Um, after we've read about you over 20 years, Kumara Swami in um, time and cost overruns procurement. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, my question is, in terms of publishing in BIPA, the regular issue, at what point in time should one submit his article? And the special issue, how long does it take it once I submit, like on the 15th of December, when will it be published? Thank you. Okay. So, right, if you're talking about the current special issue that was on 15th of December, as an example, um, the publication for that, it depends on the other issues in the pipeline, right? So like, like just like any other journal. So it's not just the speed. and we do take uh, very great care. And I said, sometimes we go to R3, R4. So we are constrained uh, by the longest taking paper. But having said that, if there's one that's taking very long, it just uh, gets shunted into a regular issue and we do publish. So the short answer to your question is it will be in early 2023. So it will be a little over 12 months. I hope maybe 13, maybe 14. Uh, we have scheduled it, but I, I don't want to, uh, you know, say it, uh, commit to it uh, openly, but with Emerald, I do uh, say it. And even the second one, the one you didn't ask about, which we just uh, started, uh, which will close on 15th February, that one will be uh, also early 2023. So, so it's going to be over 12 months for a special issue. Um, we try to get it in 12 months, but you know, because of the pipeline and so on, and making sure we get everything that is publishable into it, uh, at least most, most of what is publishable. As I said, one or two do. Now, even the bump issue I talked about that was just published, we are going to have one more paper which is still being reviewed and it's, it's on R4 and it may be acceptable now as suggested it has been telling me. 
So I hope that answers your question. Duda. Yes, yeah. The other question is the regular issue. At what point in time should one submit? Oh, any point in time. There's uh, no time uh, limit because it's, it's a continuous process. So any point in time, when you're ready with a good paper, just look at the author guidelines, make sure it's in the right format. So if you want it to move faster, um, um, you, you, you uh, just make sure that you're complied with all the, the, the length, the structured abstract, and the tables in a separate document, uh, a separate word file and so on, one separate word file, and then make sure your abstract is giving the clear picture, etc. I'm not just addressing you. I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm, address, I'm addressing to everyone who's listening. And then submit and it'll move. And by the way, I must qualify my previous answer. Uh, thank you uh, for asking another question. Uh, although I say uh, over 12 months, that's for the print edition, right? The, the online uh, publication will be earlier. So hopefully that should be a couple of months earlier, maybe one, at least one month earlier. So the print edition is because we got to give a special issue number, but it's published published in early sight as they call it without a special uh, number, but uh, issue number. But of course, special issue paper is known to be a special issue paper, but you don't see it on the early sight board. So hope that's okay, Duga. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Mahan. Thank you, Duga. Thank you, Mohan. We'd love to have some some more questions or comments. So Mohan. Mohan, how does one become a reviewer? How, how does, if uh, one of our, let's say, early career researchers are out there in the audience and they would like to become a reviewer and help the journal and, and kind of learn how to do that, how, how would they go about that? What would be the best way um, for someone who has an interest to become a journal reviewer? Okay, uh, good question. And it's uh, not an uncommon question. So hopefully they would have some experience, in, uh, some experience in publishing papers themselves. So they would have been at the receiving end if you want to put it like that. So before, okay, if you continue that uh, metaphor, to before becoming a gamekeeper, one should be a poacher. So one should be uh, having submitted papers and gone through the um, process of getting it accepted. And then you know what reviewers do. So you should definitely have some idea of what it takes to be a reviewer before you apply to be one. And what, what are the uh, skills, the knowledge uh, necessary? And then to answer your question, you could, uh, apply to the editors of the journals that, that are in your area of interest, uh, looking at the scope, look at a few journals. And, uh, and in, for more reasons than one, because one may not uh, straight away be receptive. So if, if there are three journals uh, out of the 10 you looked at, which are in your field of expertise, apply to the editors in all three. I'm not saying apply to BPAM, BPAM but if BPAM is in that list, certainly uh, email me and then uh, give us your CV, uh, the papers you've published and your areas of interest, right? So usually all our reviewers have already uh, done their PhDs, uh, but we do have some from industry. Uh, although I must admit that we don't get so many papers from industry, which I'm sad about because I was actually in industry <laughs> before I joined academia. <laughs> So, uh, um, yeah, so then we will consider and I will keep it in mind that we could add it to the database, but usually I try to match with the paper that's coming in when I'm pre-screening. And I might tell the associate editor there's a guy like this or a lady like this who is interested and has got this expertise, has published uh, this type of paper and uh, also hopefully has reviewed something for a conference or something, some experience that helps. Um, so that's yep. the easy way. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great, thanks. And uh, Raymond has a question in text chat. I'm not sure if you can see it, I can read it. He says his PhD research focuses on the application of ISO 55,000 AM standards. And I don't know what 
that is, but maybe you do, Mohan. Um, is is this a topic relevant to BPAM? I may be wrong, but is it asset management, Raven? Uh, yes, it is. It's the um, 55,000 asset management standard. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, it is relevant, of course. Yeah. Okay. Because I was looking yeah. at your special issues and your special interest topics. Um, yeah, I couldn't see anything that, that I thought you know, might be relevant, but no, it's okay. I, I, will, I was um, write a paper and, and submit yeah, for the coming issue on sustainability. Yeah, sure, sure, because it would fall under that. I mean, it depends on your exact focus of your paper, but I mean, just the topic is, uh, is certainly relevant. Yeah, certainly yeah, relevant. It's, 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 a, it's, um, it's focused on a public sector, the New Zealand public sector, on both infrastructure and, and large portfolio assets like public housing. Great, great. And uh, if you want to so sound it off me, you could send me an abstract in yep. the structured abstract form. You can get the format from the Emerald. Uh, well, it's, it's not just for BPM, that same format is used for all Emerald journals. Uh, hmm. So. You can get that. Have a look at a couple of BPAM papers if you're sending to me. And yes. uh, if you find another journal that is more relevant, it's up to you. But uh, the, the topic is uh, relevant to BPAM. Oh, and no, then I mean, send... I've spoken to Suzanne. And um, yeah, she's very supportive of me submitting to BPAM. <laughs> oh, are you in Massey University then? I am Massey University. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She, she should be supportive. She's on the board. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But that's not the only reason. It's it's a good journal. Uh, so yeah, uh, send it. Uh, do do do. Uh, send me a structured abstract, and I'll give you some feedback. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Are there any any other comments from our group? You know, maybe I'll I'll ask one more. Uh, Mohan, we we've heard a lot about special issues. How does how does the journal select the topics for special issues, or if somebody is interested? in a special issue topic that they want to put forth? Can, can they do that with the specialty editors or how, what's, what's the process or how does that happen, these special issues? Yeah, very good question. In fact, uh, one of the joint editors, Yasangika told me I should put a slide on that, but I said, I don't, don't want to, if it comes up, I will answer it. So you brought it up. <laughs> so, uh, because to be honest, it can just happen, as you said, they, but they, again, I'm sorry, it's, it's me. <laughs> so they can send me a proposal. Uh, they can look at the special issues that we've had before, the type of topics, but theirs could be completely different. I mean, like we didn't have anything on circular economy or industry 4.0, but when Bangkoli proposed it. Now, the thing is, as I told you, Sangika, who told me this morning, why don't we put a, why don't I put a slide up on that? By the way, I didn't mention, uh, but it's in the slides, I'm sorry. Uh, the slides on reviewing papers, I'm sorry to digress a bit. I must thank Yasangika for sharing her slides with me. Uh, she had prepared some slides and of course uh, worked on those and tweaked them. So, and she suggested I have something on the, how to become a guest editor. So back to the question, um, the, it so happens as I told her that all the guest editors who have come have uh, successfully well, no one has been really unsuccessful. Everything has come through. It's just that one or two did drop off on the way when the proposal stage. But once the proposal is in and approved by BPAM, no one dropped off, went through. So, uh, but I happen to know most of them because that gives uh, all their colleagues or their, the university where they are working on who have recommended them as you know conscientious <laughs> because you've got to have the knowledge, you've got to have the passion, you've got to have the time to do the special issue and then you make a proposal to me <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll see whether it fits BPAM and if so uh, we can move it forward develop a proposal it has to be put to Emerald and Emerald uh, checks it and uh, says whether it's okay or not and uh, well, so far BPAM has built up a reputation. They never say no to us, but uh, I shouldn't say that uh, in public, but uh, because I'm maybe I'm pretty careful and I help the development of the proposal if it's got some substance to start with. I mean, I can't build it from scratch. So, so if they've got something and uh, they've got some credentials, ideally they've done something more than becoming a review, obviously, 
they've actually uh, contributed to something at a higher level uh, than just being a reviewer. Of course, I know you got to make a start somewhere. So you don't have to have done a special issue, but maybe for a conference publication, you've been uh, active in the team or something like that. So you have uh, some experience of, you know, uh, going out and getting good papers and uh, deciding which ones will move forward and then send them for review. So something like that. I uh, hope that was not too long and I got my answer within that, what I said. Thank you. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for Mohan or discussion points for the greater good? Yeah, we still have some time. We still I have, mean, little, uh, we have about, nine, about nine or 10 minutes left to have uh, some good discussion. Uh, I Professor see Florence Mohan, is unmuted. Can I just add to this uh, special editor matter? Yes. Professor Mohan? Yes, please. Okay, so... Um, I was waiting for you to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to arrow me to talk. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I think um, if you look at the special issues in BPEM, usually it is not just one uh, guest editor. Uh, there will be one or two or three. And therefore, if you are relatively junior, uh, don't be disappointed and, and think that you do not have chance. You, you can be pair, you can pair yourself with a more senior and experienced uh, author who has also done special issues before. And so you can go in as a team as you propose to Prof Mohan your special issue. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Yes. Yes. Advice. I think uh, Duga. Has yeah, again, yeah. <laughs> Thank you once again, uh, Mohan. But um, another question in terms of quality, what would be your opinion or suggestion in terms of um, special issue and regular issue? Um, is the expectation in terms of quality the same? In BPAM, short answer for a change. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's why my guest editors are sort of kept on their toes. I, I don't, I mean, they're, sometimes in other journals, they are allowed to work on their own, but I do. But they, I, somehow they feel, because as I said, I know most of them, uh, if not all, uh, the, the, because one person takes a lead. Okay, I must tell you, I mean, uh, not that I'm contradicting what Florence said, but only one person can handle the system. So the lead uh, guest editor will be actually seeing all the papers and he might consult his senior person as Florence said for things that are more difficult to decide on the quality whether it's going to move forward or not uh, but since the lead person should have enough knowledge so what they do they usually since I know them they they send me the first couple of papers and ask me for my inputs and they say okay here's what I think but I may have missed something and not that I asked them to do it, but they, they, I give them some guidelines and then they, it so happens that they generally send the first two or three to me uh, while screening, maybe the first two. And uh, after that, they sort of realize what we're looking for. And I try to keep the standard the same. Um, so I, do you have any different opinion about that, uh, Duga? If I may throw no, it no. back at you. No, I'm just, um curious to know maybe if there's a difference in terms of the quality or expectations and special issues and regular issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mohan. Welcome. Yeah. Emily. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hello. I, I hope you can hear me and okay. Um, thank you, Mohan. It's been a very interesting presentation and you have already admitted that you get to see all of this um, research coming across your desk first. So you're in a very good position to give us some insights into the trends that you're seeing um, from submissions. And do you have any, any thoughts in terms of maybe trends regarding methodologies, regarding um, specific topics that are emerging as, as we speak, um, what are you seeing 
sort of becoming dominant and prominent in the next year or so in terms of this area of research? Okay, very, very good question, but not easy to answer because I haven't really looked at it like that, although I should. Um, there are some new ones to answer part of your question. Like recently I got one on COVID. Uh, on indoor air quality um, and it was a simulation and unfortunately the feedback I gave and that was from a country that has never I mean I haven't seen a publication from that country I won't mention the name but it was a very detailed paper and then it was screened I thought it was worth handling I mean it was full of <laughs> equations and so on but they've done some mathematical modeling of the indoor air quality and made some recommendations for hospitals. And we gave the feedback, I mean, I obviously moderated it and added to it. And a standard question we ask, at the, well, most if not all, is uh, what is your validation method? So some of the author wrote back to me and asked, uh, you know, this is a mathematical simulation. We don't have any validation plan. So I said, well, it's okay. It's a different uh, thing, paper type of paper that you, that we usually get. But uh, aren't you going to, uh, aren't you planning to have it tested somewhere? Uh, because otherwise, how will you convince people to use that mathematical model? And uh, unfortunately, there was uh, uh, no <laughs> response after that. He actually asked me. He did ask me at the end of his email. Is it uh, suitable for BPM? I said, I think so. I think we will we'll certainly consider it, but just let us know whether you even plan for some validation and then tell us what that would be so that we can see what's going to be the next step on this. Unfortunately, he didn't uh, bite the bit. So <laughs> that uh, I didn't get a resubmission of the unsubmission, but okay, that's just one example. Uh, trends, um, I mean, the new normal, the usual thing. So our special issues might reflect some of that the current one transforming the construction industry. The KPIs, uh, which is in progress, uh, um, is actually linked to the Global Leadership Forum in Construction, Engineering and Management, uh, which has a KPI group. KPI and trends, to use the complete word, it's exactly what you're talking about. KPI and trends, we have a group in that, uh, and a pretty active group. We meet once in two months uh, on Zoom, of course, and uh, Mark Hastak and uh, Diana Costa from Brazil is now leading it. Mark Hastak was uh, leading it for a long time. Uh, Jean Vium from South Africa. Uh, another one or two colleagues from Hong Kong. Um, so anyway, uh, so we do look at trends in research, in uh, teaching, in courses, construction management co courses, because that's the remit of that. GLF CEM, Global Leadership Forum in Construction, Engineering and Management. If you're interested, Emily, you could uh, Google it. It's the GLF-CEM. Uh, and that has got this working group on KPIs and trends. We have annual newsletters and we make a presentation at the annual conference. The next one is going to be in Sydney in May or June, 2022. Uh, but journals, okay, we are going to not get everything that you're talking about because we are going to get the papers focused uh, targeting BPM, right? So I'm not the best person to give a, a total picture, but certainly I should I should make myself uh, uh, more able to give a part picture from what crosses my desk. Um, maybe next time I'll talk about it. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. And uh, a question from Amos, how regular are the regular issues? Oh, so we had five issues per year up to this year, and it'll be six from next year. So uh, the, these are talking about printed editions. They should be on average every two months next year, I suppose. So uh, yeah, that's it. Does that answer the question, Haruna? Yeah, Amos? I think so. I, I think that does, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, if you tie that up with the previous question, when to the Duga asked, I mean, when to submit, as I said, any time, because it's a moving target, right? So don't, don't wait for an auspicious time. When you're ready with a good paper, put it in the right format and uh, 
submit it and screen it first. Yeah. Great, great. Well, we're 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 at the hour. Um, are there any other any other final thoughts from our from our from our group from our audience? We we had in the we were in the high twenties, I think, at one point, Mohan. So that's that's wonderful. All right. We oh, will... but we had over sixty registered. Okay, so yeah, uh, some yeah, right. yeah, yeah, and we'll definitely um, we will definitely archive this great yeah. presentation um, in a couple of weeks, and we'll let all of our members, uh, including the sixty registrants, know know that as well. And, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for joining us from around the world and, and asking some excellent questions and having a great discussion and learning a little bit more about uh, the review process and what's expected. And uh, I thought really the highlights and, you know, the differences, uh, thinking about special issues and regular issues and, and the process that you described very, very insightful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope everyone has a great day.